mobile technology is for kids. So I specifically said it that way because when we did Logo, what we'd say, computers are for kids. There's a lot of different objectives, but my objective is that there is this amazing mobile technology, which everybody and his uncle is saying is the most amazing thing to happen in computers since the beginning of, of the Stone Age or something. Mm -hmm. It's amazing and it's changed everything. But if you look at what's happening in the world of computer education, it might as well not exist. That to me is kind of amazing. And I don't know why it is. Maybe it's that everybody who's doing computer and education, you know, grew up in the 1980s and 1990s before this technology existed. So they're imagining that kids today will be excited by the same kinds of things that they were excited as as kids. But the fact is that to kids today, that's the computing that your grandparents were doing. Mm. Mm -hmm. it, it's not stuff that you can throw around and touch and hold and link to all sorts of other things on the web and shake and... And use with, with your friends right. and... Right. So, that you're connected to literally during your waking hours. It's so, attached to your body. So App Inventor is basically saying that mobile technology is for kids. So I specifically said it that way because when we did Logo, what we'd say, computers are for kids. So if you go back to 19, gosh, 74 or 79, there were these crazy people at MIT who said, there are these million dollar giant machines that are used by the Department of Defense and giant companies, and you know what? We think kids ought to be able to program them. And I think it was about 1981 that mm -hmm. I was doing that programming right. on a TRS right. something in the basement of my elementary school when driving a little triangular shaped turtle around the screen drawing a box. But just the idea that what this technology should get used for is put it in the hands of kids. It's hard to imagine today how radical a statement that was. I mean, Papert deserves incredible credit. Papert and Cynthia Solomon and Wally Fertz and all these people for, gosh, in 68, they were saying kids ought to be able to program computers. Now make the analogy today. We're saying this mobile technology that everybody is worried about and harping and screaming and there's all this stuff going on in Congress and privacy and mm -hmm. issues and it's dangerous and scary. And what we're saying is, well, you know, the appropriate thing to do with that is you put it in the hands of kids. Let them figure it out. And it is no more crazy statement than the thing about computers. So that's what App Inventor's about. It's saying, look, this technology, the way you actually introduce a technology really is you make it so even kids can use that and you give them the power and you give them the same excitement as everybody else. So it's the exact same agenda as it was in right. so the when I, 60s. When I so. thought about App Inventor, I was specifically thinking about Logo in that view. So mm. what's amazing is, you know, I started doing that what, four or five years ago and still there is not the idea that kids should be the ones who are making mobile computing. And it's, I don't know, we'll see, we'll see how long it takes. Right? Maybe it'll take another 20 years. It's being picked up in pockets, but they're yeah. small pockets. Well, there's a huge maker movement right now that's kind right. of... Well, it's the same thing. Why don't, one, of the, one of the coolest things to make stuff with is, mobile, is apps and mobile technology. But again, it's not, it's not happening. What do you think about Scratch? Well, Scratch, it, Scratch shares that it's about kids and computing, but Scratch doesn't do mobile technology. I mean, everybody yeah. sort of says, well, you have these blocks and you drag them around, so they must be the same. But that's not the issue. The issue is not the programming language. It's what can you do with it. Do you have anything you'd like to say to Apple? You know, a Apple at one level makes tremendous, tremendous consumer things. They also understand education, but somehow they're locked into wanting to have enormous control over what's going into iOS. You know, certainly it makes it very difficult for those of us who are trying to empower people because you run smack into Apple's idea of what's, what's controlling Are them. there specific things that they you'd like them to do, like a wish list? They either Apple to, Apple. either Apple or Google for Android. Well, Apple for iOS 
just needs to open up the ability that, that people can distribute iOS apps. They have to say, you know, why is it, suppose, suppose I wanted every 12 year old to be able to distribute iOS apps, what are, what are the things, partly in the technology, but mostly in Apple's policy, mm -hmm. that's making that possible, that's making that impossible. Right now, it's a hundred bucks a shot for a developer's license, and you have to have it if you want to give someone else an app. Or even if you want to run it on your own device, you have to get a developer's license. Yeah. So Apple needs to figure out how to relax. It's kind of—I mean, there's certainly people on Apple who've, you know, who've pioneered the other view, so I think they understand it. It's just yeah. that that they're they're wedged in some way where they can't take a risk or something. They're too worried about privacy. They're too worried worried about malware. And it's an interesting juxtaposition to Apple to E, for example, that came with the circuit diagram in the box. Mm -hmm. Yeah. To look at that versus iOS. So I, I think what's happening is everyone's deciding that, that computers are just too important for kids to be able to use them. So instead, you make the kind of artificial environments that are happening in computer education now. Mm -hmm. But it's not, I think, the original view that a lot of us have, that it's really about empowering people. And that's the original view from the beginning that yes. Papert had. I mean, Papert sort of said, it's getting kids to view themselves as intellectual agents. And one of the ways mm. that you get to do that is you get to practice in this world where there's, there's amazing, powerful technology. So kind mm. of what's happening is what Logo was in, oh gosh, 74, say, was a thing that was out of reach to anybody. Um, then personal computers came out in 81 and 82, and then you started unlocking that power. And kids could say, gosh, I can make the kind of things that real people are using that are interesting to me. And now you look at the analogy with mobile technology. Kids are locked out of, I'd say, the real use of computing. And it's sort of, it's sort of you know, kind of amazing to me that it is such a blank spot in how, in how the computer education world just just doesn't see that. I mean, there are hundreds of thousands of apps that you can get for 99 cents, and well, sure. that same screen can play Angry Birds rather than Absolutely. make Angry Birds. Yeah. Well, that's within the digital realm. This is even within the computer education realm, which computing education realm, which is very specifically about teaching computing, being able to program and build things. And yet they still haven't latched on to mobile as not the future anymore, but the present. Yeah, it's not even, we used this, to say it was the future four years ago. Yeah, I'm so grateful I stumbled up here because ta in talking with Edith and, and um, Cynthia about, it, it reminded me, I read Mindstorms in 80 and um, I taught Logo and I remember the excitement when, you know, I first made a recursive loop. That's right. And, we sure. got to remember that. As a matter of fact, Sergey Brin talks about his first Commodore 64 and working with BASIC. Yep, and, he, of course. and he said he's worried that machines today are too closed and kids aren't given access to that source code. Computing and mobile computing is so important that we should be giving kids the ability to do it. You know, there are always levels of abstraction. It's not that you need to get access to stuff in assembly language or even the source code level or something like BASIC. It's that you get access at a level where you can do creative, exciting things. Creative, exciting, and powerful yeah. things. What is the thing that's being auctioned? Uh, oh, the thing and how much can auctioned. we bid for it? <laughs> I don't know what, what, how, they're, how they're doing the bids, but basically they've got a bunch of a bunch of famous historical, interesting, they're calling them algorithms, but I think they're either programs or things. or artifacts or something, but the one that I put in is actually, when I showed up at MIT, my first job yeah. as a graduate student was, there was this robot turtle thing, right, that ran out on the floor, and I was, I made the first graphical one, so there's this bunch of code, which is sort of the first turtle graphic system, and that's, that's what's being auctioned, it's probably about 80 pages. Of is that thing. the code that you're most proud of, when you think... And of all the things you've worked on, or is there something that sort of stands out? No, the thing that stands out, I think, that I'm most proud about is the stuff that we did later in MIT's main intro computer course, which was the, the scheme dialect coming out of LISP and had just an enormous impact on, on college computing education. I was a product reviewer, and I remember your name specifically with things that, uh, how can I say this tactfully? 
didn't suck. <laughs> yeah, right. Because there was a lot of stuff that really did suck. And yeah, right. um, so when I, you know, I, I heard you were here, it was, uh, it, I get, got very excited. So I thank you for letting me well, sure. point a camera at you. No, and uh, I'll, You can edit that how you like. Uh, it's it's open source. I know it's we all believe in that. However, I, I can pull I'll, the individual words out and make you say things. <laughs>